Welcome to the Australian Bushranging Podcast. G'day everyone, welcome to the Australian Bushranging Podcast. I'm Aidan Feel and I'm the historian, writer, content creator, uh, what have you, um, behind a guide to Australian bushranging. And if you're watching this on YouTube, this is our second foray into this podcasting caper. Uh, some of you who follow a Guide to Australian Bushranging on Facebook and on Instagram will know that there actually is a Spotify account and there is a podcast that is uh, going on there as well. It is slightly different to what's coming up on, on YouTube the content there will be more focused on specific incidents and sort of telling bush ranger stories whereas this is something that's got a bit more of a broader scope so if you want to check that out um, I will put a link in the description of this video so that you can have a look at what's up there there's not much up there at the moment but it will be added to over time obviously now, uh, today's topic, or this instalment's topic, is something that's a little bit different because originally I had thought I would do a specific topic related to a bush ranger or bush ranging for the second instalment, but I just had this flash of inspiration and thought I might just tell my story of how I got interested in bush ranging and all the things that sort of led up to where I am right now. Maybe someone else has had a similar journey. They've, uh, you know, found a passion for bush ranging or Australian history that kind of mirrors aspects of my journey. Or maybe it's just a, a good insight into how someone can get such a uh, an interest. Either way. Um, hopefully this is entertaining, if not informative. And uh, yeah, so let's get stuck in. So I know exactly when my journey started. Uh, it was a very memorable thing. So uh, in 1998, I was in grade six. And... Our topic for the first term was Australia's heritage. It wasn't history, it was referred to as heritage, which is, I think, an interesting thing. We don't really know uh, much about our own history here in Australia. There's a few reasons for that. Um, I won't go into them too deep, but let's just say that the main reason why we don't teach our history to our students in primary and secondary school is there's a level of uh, cultural cringe which prevents us from wanting to do it and there's also a lot of politics involved uh, so yeah I won't go into the, the nitty-gritty of that that's a topic for another time um, I suffice it to say that going into this unit my understanding of Australian history was flimsy at best I knew about the Anzacs, I knew about the First Fleet, I knew about the Aboriginal people. And that was about it, you know. Um, in the years previous, the only uh, stuff that I'd done about history was all sort of like family history or um, uh, more sort of broad stuff. Nothing specifically about Australia. Now, I think a lot of kids had that experience more or less anyway because of that being the topic for the term that was also the subject of our, f our school camp for that year so every year the the camp had to be themed around whatever it was we were doing that particular term so the school camp for that year was to Beechworth because I'm a Victorian, I'm a Melbourne kid, so um, our journey started in Melbourne suburbs and went all the way out 
to Beechworth. And of course, anyone who's been on that trip knows there's a lot to do with Ned Kelly. Um, for myself, I knew the name Ned Kelly, um, and I had vague memories of knowing the helmet. That was about it. Um, the only other thing I know from before that camp trip was something that only sort of gained uh, relevance later on in hindsight, which was that my grandma had been on a trip up to the northeast with her social club, and when she came back, she had this flyer from the animated theatre in Glen Rowan, and I remember her talking about going in and there was you know the gunfight and everything and then they take you into this little house and the roof catches on fire um, so you know there was no context for me other than that and it didn't really mean anything to me at the time I just remember yeah that little anecdote and that, that flyer so uh, going up to Beechworth, I was going in fresh. I was going in without any sort of preconceived notions. The first place that we stopped, I would always remembered uh, stopping in Euroa. I was, I remember, I had this distinct memory of one of the teachers mentioning that we were in Euroa. But uh, when I was digging around for the photographs that I'd taken on the trip. I found a photo from when we had our first stop and there's a definite rocket ship in a, in a garden so um, that the only place I know that has that in the northeast is the Benalla Botanical Gardens uh, so I guess my memory was incorrect and I, but that's kind of um, that proves something about the unreliability of the memory. You know, it took me digging up these photos to be able to remember something that only happened 20 something years ago. Um, funny how, how that happens, I, I guess. And so the first place that we stopped to do something was in Glen Rowan. And the place that we went to in Glen Rowan was the animated theatre. So this is my first sort of step into the world of Ned Kelly. So the first thing that we saw when we got in was you had Ned in his body armor with the, the dries of bone and the cowboy hat on the other side of the room looking at you as you came in the door. And then on the right hand side, as you come in the door, um, sort of in the middle of the room was this wooden hand cart. And on the cart was a coffin open lid coffin with Joe Byrne in it and there was a bloke with a moustache and a cowboy hat standing next to the, the cart not a real guy, they were, they were wax figures and you know most of them are still there anyway very odd thing to sort of come into the first thing that you are experiencing with this story um, so I go in and none of the kids as far as I was aware had any knowledge of what this place was or what the significance of the story was but by the end of it pretty much everyone was hyped about Ned Kelly and I do know uh, that my grandma's anecdote took place before this because by the time that we went uh, they were no longer um, setting fire to the roof uh, at the at the inn in the, the show because it had actually malfunctioned sometime previous and the the building had actually burnt down partially so there was no we didn't even go into that building um, we just sort of bypassed it so that's how I know uh, that that anecdote came beforehand anyway so we go up to Beechworth and we're staying at the old Priory and I just remember it having this really weird vibe, you know, in the, uh, you know, in British stories, you know, whether they're films or television shows or books or whatever, where 
you've got the boys that uh, sent off to boarding school and they're in those big dormitories it, that's the kind of vibe that I was getting from the accommodation but I liked it you know we we're in these bunk beds and everything and um, it was a very nice building a um, bit of a spooky atmosphere at night time which you know for someone like me who's interested in all that stuff that that was very appropriate but I remember over the next couple of days um, there was a lot of hiking <laughs> and uh, we did do a trip to the Panda magazine and a trip to the Burke Museum the Burke Museum was really where everything just kind of got, got switched on I remember we went to the courthouse as well but um, the Burke Museum was the most interesting because we, we went there when the place was otherwise empty and we had someone guiding us around and having a, a talk to us and that was when they actually had the replica suit of Kelly armor in the museum and it was in a display case with the death mask which was in basically like a, a cloche a glass bell jar with a little handwritten tag on it there's something stuck in my head about the armour and also what stood out in my mind was um, they had all those Ned collectibles at that time everywhere that you went that was related to Ned Kelly in some way had these little plaster statues that were painted grey so um, we went to some other places around Beechworth and uh, one of the places that we did go to was Harry Power's Cell. Well, that's what it's labelled as now, but at that point it was Ned Kelly's Cell. So back then, um, I don't think they felt maybe comfortable promoting it as uh, Harry Power's Cell. Maybe they didn't think that it would uh, attract enough attention. Who knows? But definitely the the signage has changed over the years it was as unremarkable then as it is now it sort of just was this cramped little space with the dirt floor and lots of dust everywhere and there was um, yeah lots of people crowding around inside trying to figure out what it was and no one really feeling like they gained anything from it funnily enough but I have heard since that at one point they had um, a bed set up in the cell with a, little, with a dummy on it representing Harry Power um, and I think they took it away because it was frightening people they thought there was a, a tramp in there or something I don't know and the other place that we went to that I remember very fondly was the what was then called the MB brewery which is actually Bilson's and uh, they, we went on a tour there, we went through all the different parts of the building and learned about how they used to make drinks. And we got to taste test the uh, Portello that they did, which single-handedly got me hooked on Portello for a very long time. Uh, and at the end of that, I managed to buy um, a pack of bottles of Ned Kelly soft drink, or Kelly Country soft drink, I can't remember what they, the actual word that they used was, but they all had these silly pun names of the flavours like uh, Reckless Raspberry and Kelly Cola, um, it was Lynch Lime was one of them, which, yeah, I don't know where, where they got that one from, anyway, so I had these little, I had one of those little grey statues as well, which I'd got, it was of uh, Ned in his armour and he's crouching down. I come back from my trip and I'm, I've got Ned Kelly fever. I was just absolutely hooked because, again, like this is my first experience of Australian history. And there's very few places that you can really connect with the history in a very tangible sense um, other than these regional towns like Beechworth. And at that point, Ned Kelly was kind of unfashionable but it was still very popular in Beechworth, um, not so much now. So 
from that point onwards I wanted to learn more about the story and we had to do all these projects related to the history and a lot of other kids did stuff about Ned Kelly but you know none of them took it as seriously as I did and one of the things that my teacher had in her various resources a little library there in the classroom was the magazine that was produced to commemorate the last outlaw so it was released in conjunction with the miniseries back in 1980 and I was addicted to that magazine I wanted to learn everything I possibly could I was fascinated not only by the history aspects of it but also the filmmaking aspects of it and so in one fell swoop um, this unit had not only kick-started my fascination with Australian history and bushrangers but also my desire to be a filmmaker and I remember very vividly the final assessment for that unit was we had this um, event at the school where everyone had to dress up as a historical figure from the unit and they had to be able to pretend to be that person and answer questions and, and so on and there were some kids, well there was probably about two or three other Ned Kellys apart from myself. Now I had the much better costume because uh, uh, my dad was very good at making costumes and stuff and so we had our Ned Kelly armour that had been made out of cardboard but spray painted to look like it was this rusty old metal and he'd even made a false beard for me to wear because Ned Kelly had a beard of course. So I looked the biz, but some of the other kids who were playing Ned Kelly seemed to know some of the bits of information that I hadn't been able to remember. And I remember being extremely embarrassed because I didn't know those bits of information, things like how many siblings did he have. So in a sense that not knowing pushed me even more to, f to be able to find the answers to those questions because I'm like well now this is a subject that I'm really really fascinated by I should know all of this stuff so for the, the next year which is when I was moving into secondary school Ned Kelly was the main thing that I was interested in it was the thing that meant the most to me and uh, you know, kind of consumed most of my waking hours in one way or another but the, there's one item that I have in my collection that comes from this time which means an, a lot to me which is I was given as a present from my parents a copy of Ned Kelly's Short Life and the reason that it's so precious to me is not only is it the book that kind of allowed me to really become knowledgeable quite deeply knowledgeable about the Kelly story it also is signed by Ian Jones I met him in 2002 at Ned the Exhibition and uh, he very graciously signed it for me it was a, a really big moment for me obviously but not so much for him because he had dozens hundreds of people that were coming up to see him and get his autograph or tell him their anecdotes about oh my great great grandmother danced with Ned Kelly or whatever it was that you know, everyone's got a variant of those stories somewhere in their family tree I think but he was very gracious with all the people and he was gracious with me and that always stuck so even now when so even now, when there's things that he asserted was unquestionably true, and I'm not inclined to agree, I still have a lot of respect for the work that he did do, not only as a historian, a biographer, but also as an ambassador for what this community should be. We should all, regardless of which 
angle we look at the story from, be able to treat each other with patience, respect and kindness. At any rate, all of that uh, continued on into my high school years. Um, I remember getting in trouble a number of times because I was drawing pictures of the Kelly gang instead of doing work. Though the teachers did have to concede that, you know, the illustrations were very good and um, they did take a lot of interest in the fact that I was so passionate about that story. One of the things that um, became very apparent later on, I was in year 11, year 12, we had to give a little talk about a topic and I ended up talking about Ned Kelly as the topic and what should have been a discussion about whether he was a hero or villain uh, ended up just being me telling the entire Kelly story for pretty much the whole period. No one stopped me. No one said, all right, we're going to have to pull that one back because other kids need to do their stuff. Um, and everyone seemed to be a bit transfixed. Um, when I was in year 12, I grew out my beard because um, someone had dared me because I had facial hair since I was in year 8. And, um, yeah, people dared me to just grow it out. So I did, and I got the nickname Ned, which I thought was appropriate. And so that year, uh, for muck-up day, I went to school dressed up in my homemade Ned Kelly outfit, which, unfortunately, was no longer the one that I'd had in, in primary school. I had to make another one from scratch. By that time, I'd also sort of moved on a little bit from Ned. Um, and I actually found Joe Byrne to be a little bit more interesting because you know something about him being more of a, a poet and a ladies man and all that that really captured my imagination and um, I started wearing high-heeled boots and sports jackets in a way to try and emulate the, the style of dress that they wore um, though it was amusing because that very you know distinctive clop sound that those boots made as I was walking around used to freak out some of the kids because they thought a teacher was coming and they were going to get into trouble I don't know what they were doing but you know but then once I'd uh, finished high school the the bug sort of receded a little bit you know buried down a little and I became interested in other topics and because I wasn't able to pursue filmmaking as I had intended, I ended up um, pursuing writing and uh, started to get more interested in science fiction and fantasy and things like that. And So Ned was always there, but he was in the background somewhere. And it wasn't until years later that um, I really rekindled that interest largely due to the Ned Kelly weekend in Beechworth, which gave me a really good excuse to be able to go and do something with my family, um, taking my son up there and getting him sort of immersed in all the stuff that had inspired me as a child. And uh, unfortunately that event no longer runs. It was a good one. It was a good way of getting people up there and in amongst it all and even providing an opportunity for other enthusiasts to get to know each other though I was always on the outer with those sort of things I never really considered myself part of that community and then uh, everything changed when a certain Kickstarter campaign started being talked about I saw this pitch video I knew of Kickstarter, but I didn't really understand how it worked. Anyway, this pitch video is for a movie about Ben Hall. Now, I knew about most of the Bush Rangers because obviously, when you get interested in Ned Kelly, you learn about all the others because you've got to get all the Bush Ranger books because that's where he's talked about. Um, and as I was fascinated by film, I always said, you know, I really wish that there was a definitive. Ned Kelly film where they wouldn't stray from the history, they'd actually portray it as accurately as possible. 
Anyway, in this pitch video for this Ben Hall movie, I see this filmmaker has pretty much the same view as I do about history and portraying it on film. So this guy's name is Matthew Holmes, and I'm like, okay, I've never heard of him before, but I like the cut of his jib, so I pledged. I didn't have much money at all to be doing that sort of thing, but I thought if he really does have the the mindset that he is portraying in this video, then what we're going to get is something really, really special. And I want to be a part of that. So it was through backing the legend of Ben Hall uh, on Kickstarter to get the short film made that I was sort of thrown headfirst into the world of bushranging again. But this time it wasn't just about Ned. Um, it was the broader picture as well, which was something that, you know, as I said, it was something that I knew of, but I wasn't really immersed in. It was all Ned, Ned, Ned. Um, I even ended up being an extra on The Legend of Ben Hall and helping build some of the uh, models that they use for the miniature shots and um, just absolutely loved the experience and um, even if I hadn't done all those things I still would have absolutely adored the film because it there's one thing you can definitely say about it is that what... Matthew Holmes set out to achieve he succeeded in doing which is he made a film that was as historically accurate as possible and it did so in a way that was entertaining you know people can watch the film and get a history lesson while actually getting a really good human drama which is very rare usually you get one or the other and then from there I'd sort of made some of these associations and I got a, uh, a message from Matthew one day. He said, how would you feel about working on an Ed Kelly movie? And in my head I'm going, well, I've only wanted to do it since I was 12 years old, 13 years old. So yeah, I'd say yes, I would like to do that. And that was when we started work on... The Legend of Ned Kelly, which was going to be um, that definitive Ned Kelly movie that I'd always had dreams about. And we spent a lot of time devising the story that we would portray on film, you know, where were we going to start, where were we going to end, what were we going to focus on. And as it turned out, doing a cradle to grey story of Ned Kelly in under two hours is impossible. Uh, you just can't do it, which is why when you see um, most uh, those standalone feature films, they don't cover a lot of time. They sort of skim through the years from him either just about to go into jail um, in 1870 or just after he's come out through to when he becomes an outlaw. Even The Last Outlaw skims over a huge chunk of the history and that's just the necessity of telling stories on film. You have to cut bits out, otherwise it just bogs everyone down and your budget can only stretch so far. We ended up doing a tour around Major Kelly sites in Victoria and building up a bit of, you know, um, recognition for the project. And unfortunately, we just didn't get enough people um, pledging on a Kickstarter to be able to reach our goal. It was an ambitious goal. You know, we wanted a couple of million bucks to be able to get enough money from the producers offset to be able to get a film that was of decent quality. Unfortunately, people sort of... I think a lot of people here in Australia don't really understand the amount of money it costs to make a movie. Uh, it's not as simple as just picking up a a camcorder and getting people in hired costumes and going off you go you know there's a lot of costs involved from uh, you know hiring writers and there's the producers directors executive producers and all that stuff behind the scenes through to the 
the equipment and the, the crew and the locations and the accommodation and the catering and all that sort of stuff. So even before the film's been released, you're spending millions of dollars. I mean, the average American movie these days um, costs tens of millions of dollars, and that's considered a low-budget film. Justin Kurtzel's True History of the Kelly Gang, if I remember correctly, only had a budget of $10 million, and most of that went on Russell Crowe. So, you know, that was one of the reasons why they decided to, from what I hear, is one of the reasons that they decided to go with that um, postmodern art house depiction of the story instead of doing it as an actual historical thing. It was a direct result of that campaign and that uh, process that I went, you know what, I really think there's a gap in the market here because there was a lot of stuff online about Ned Kelly but I couldn't really find any central place where people could go online and learn about bush rangers in the broader sense um, and I really wanted to learn more about the other bush rangers because after getting involved with the legend of Ben Hall I went back to my books and I started reading about some of the other bush rangers again and I'm like you know what this is a very interesting topic why isn't anyone talking about it so I went well there's a gap in the market I'll fill the gap and so I started a guide to Australian bush ranging and I had no idea what I was doing when I started it I knew how to start up a Facebook page um, that was about it because I, I, I worked very heavily on the social media for Legend of Ned Kelly so I knew about how to use Instagram and Facebook to connect with audiences and this and that and the other the thing that really was um, new territory for me was starting up my own website and so I used WordPress now technically it's a blogging website but the way I was formatting it was not as a blog uh, blogs tended to be kind of like um, public journals you know you write your thoughts down and people can read them this was not a journal this is a you know me talking about the history and trying to impart the knowledge that I had um, and then sort of follow that journey along as I discovered more um, because of course what you get in those books about bush rangers is first of all usually just scratching the surface second of all most of it is wrong as I've found out uh, there's a lot of stuff in those books that people just sort of reiterate and it's it's not right at all especially when you're talking about some of the bush rangers with the more ruthless nasty reputations those stories of the the horrible things that they did have all been either blown out of proportion or just complete bunkum you know Michael Howe and Daniel Morgan in particular have been made out to be far worse than they actually were um, and there's all kinds of reasons why that happens but um, you know one of the first articles that I wrote was an overview of the life and career of Michael Howe and it was all based on what evidence and information I had to hand which was mostly from those secondary sources and it wasn't until this year that um, I started to question it a bit because I started looking at contemporary news articles about Michael Howe you know to see how he was reported on back then and um, to sort of try and use that information in uh, articles and stuff and what I found is the stuff that's written in the books that I'd referred to was so different to even how it was re reported in the news at the time the journey of a guide to Australian bush ranging is that continual journey of me um, finding out the truth behind these stories while at the same time recording a lot of this stuff for posterity because you know I think it's important to have a resource online that people can go to and they can access it for free uh, to be able to, to learn this history because as I said growing up uh, the school system doesn't really teach you 
anything much of your history in your, here in Australia. I mean, even in secondary school, the only Australian history that I did was a bit about um, Federation and the World Wars and the Great Depression. That was it. There was no talk about, you know, the First Fleet or the convicts or the gold rush even, um, you know, and certainly nothing to do with Aboriginal history. If I wanted to do Aboriginal history, I had to do a completely different unit. It was an elective. Um, and I'm one of those that believes that it should be compulsory to teach not only Australian history, but Aboriginal history, because that's Australian history. The Aboriginal culture was here before the, the European culture arrived, and what little of it that's been preserved needs to be protected, and we can only really continue to preserve it by having people access that history and learn the history and learn the culture. You know, there's, there's always more to the story than what you think there is. And I've resigned myself to the fact that there's an, I can't possibly, as one man, know the entirety of Bush Ranger history. Uh, and even the stuff that I do research, I often find myself um, losing track of information. Because, I mean, a lot of people can say, oh, I know all about the Kelly story, and I know this and that and the other, and they'll be able to reel off 50 people who are tangentially linked to Ned Kelly uh, in the most sort of tenuous way possible. But they can do that because they're focused on that one part of history. What I'm looking at is a myriad of stories ranging from the arrival of the First Fleet onwards. Like, it's just too much for me to, to remember. So that's part of what a guide to Australian bushranging is there for, is it's almost like a little journal of what I found out in a lot of ways. Um, and I often find myself when I'm working on articles having to go back to stuff that's on the website to say, oh yeah, that's what that was. Okay, oh, that's who that is. You know, it, it's been a, a hell of a journey getting to this point. Um, and it's, it's really weird to think that, you know, there are people from all around the world that follow the work that I do, because it was not something that was even on the cards in my mind. All I thought was, there's probably a few other people out there who have an interest in the topic. I'll create something so that, you know, they've got something to engage with, you know, um, and it's obviously become something much bigger. I mean, we've done uh, charity auctions and we've done competitions and all sorts of stuff. Uh, last year, I pulled the pin on a lot of that stuff just because of the bug. Um, and it's a lot of stuff for one person to do on his own, unfortunately. And a lot of people don't realise that, uh, with the exception of the Bush Telegraph group on Facebook, which... Um, Georgina is an admin on as well. Everything, the website, the social media, YouTube, whatever, it's just me. Except for when I have voluntary submissions from other people or um, if I do interviews, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, it's just me pulling the strings and spinning the plates. And it can be quite overwhelming at times, but it's so, so rewarding. Um, but I am very thankful that, you know, I've been able to keep this thing, this interest at my, at my heart and it's led me on to such incredible things. I mean, you know, last year I published Glen Rowan, which was my novel about the last months of the Kelly gang and it's done extremely well. There's less than a hundred copies left, you know, that for a self-published author it's almost unheard of I, I know other authors that they've gone on to bigger better things but they're, they're they've told me that you know when they first self-published a book they still had hundreds of copies left over because the only people buying them were their friends and family so i feel very very fortunate to have been able to get to where i've gotten to and um you know, there's a lot of good stuff on the horizon.
and I'm very much looking forward to bringing more of this stuff to you all to bring you more of the history and more of the stories and to really keep the flame alive as it were and um, I do hope that you will continue on that journey with me and I thank you all very very much for having sat and listened to me for all this time rattling on I promise that the next one that I do will have a bit more structure to it and it will be about a particular topic it won't just be me um, improvising so if you would like to leave some suggestions on topics that you want to hear about in future podcasts um, just leave it in the comments there and all all suggestions are considered and I will leave you on that note and uh, until next time stay safe and uh, I'll catch you later